Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. <laughs> hey, so good to see everyone. So many people showing up today. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes. Lots of Brazilians here today. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Hello, Brazil. Yeah. Paulo, Charles, Mike. Mike. Chris Oliver is here. We're Hi, big Clara. fans. Hi, Clara. Yes. Hi, Ra Ra Hi, Rachel. Rachel. Or Raquel. I, I think it's <laughs> Rachel. Awesome. Um, yeah, let us know if the sound is OK. We triple checked, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so let us know if you can hear us OK. Um, we are super happy to be here doing this live stream to have all of you here and um yeah let us know your name where are you talking from if you are currently working in any open source project or if you haven't contributed yet let us know in the chat oh from barcelona that's great you've made it caroline <laughs> carolini i don't know <laughs> yeah thanks so much everyone for moving your meetings around for us we know that here in the west coast <laughs> it's still <laughs> business hours but we won't tell your boss so it's fine you're learning something new yay from mexico wow awesome sounds is great thank you hello japan awesome <laughs> wow yay yes i'm trying to stay calm because it's <laughs> It's a very exciting, yes. Thank, thank you, everyone. Memphis. Wow. Yeah. Open source, yes. yes. I want to contribute awesome. to Rails. That's awesome. <laughs> so maybe I want to get started. Yeah. So yeah, keep telling us when you join. Um, we just want to do some housekeeping chat just to make sure that we are all on the same page. So welcome, really, really, really super welcome from us. I'm Stephanie, and I'm the co-creator of Hex Devs. And I don't know. Yay, we forgot to charge the computer, but everything is working. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm Stephanie, and this is Open Source, Open Source Thursdays. is a project that we started a few months ago, and the goal is to show the day to day to attempting to contribute to open source. So far, we have opened a pull request. Yay. It may not seem a lot, but just in that process, we learned a lot and we have been sharing what we have been learning. And yeah, so Hexabs, we do projects like this to help you become a better professional, hang out with experts, and meet other kind people in the internet. I think that's the beauty of the Ruby community. And says so Tiago. I'm Tiago. I'm also from Hex Devs, and we've been doing these live events for the past two months, I guess now. And we're super excited because I think the best way to learn is just to do stuff, right? So if you want to learn how to contribute to Rails, just start, you know. And so we will host these types of events. We have some other projects going on. So I hope you enjoyed this event and you learned a lot. So we're super excited to have you here. And yeah, yeah, so that's us. And we are super excited to be bringing Rafael. He's already here. He's going to join us in a bit. And we're super excited and uh, we're super grateful for Shopify for sponsoring this event and helping us organize and also letting Rafael join us today. We He's super busy, he's always fixing bugs. So yeah, it's awesome. Thanks Shopify again. So just gonna quickly talk about today's agenda so you know what to expect and what, to, what you're going to learn. So for, for this event, uh, we're gonna have about 40, 40 minutes of pair programming. So Rafael is gonna work on a Rails issue and he's gonna write some code and we're gonna learn from him and do a pair programming. And then at the end, we're gonna have a short, uh, I guess 30 minutes Q and A session. So if you can stay and, and ask your questions, you can drop your questions in the chat 
and we're gonna get back to them uh, in the Q&A session, or maybe you're gonna just ask Rafael as well, but feel free to, to drop your questions on the chat. And mm -hmm. so Rafael França, he's a principal engineer at Shopify, for those who don't know him. And he's also a Railscore team member. I guess he's the, the most famous contributor, <laughs> or maybe the, the, the person that has done the most contributions so far to Rails. So yeah, Rafael is gonna join us in a bit. Do you wanna tell your story? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to quickly share that I actually met Rafael at RubyConf Brazil in 2016. And I was just getting started with learning how to code in Ruby. And he joined the group of friends that I was talking to and I didn't know who he was. <laughs> Eventually I found out that he was the, mm. who he was and I was, I just thought, okay, it's actually good that I didn't know who he was, otherwise <laughs> I wouldn't have said anything. Yeah. But <laughs> he's starstruck. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we already have some some great questions. Yeah, from Alessandro. And yeah, so I think we are ready to bring Rafael. Rafael, we will put you on the stage. Thank you so much for being here, Rafael. Mm -hmm. Hi, hello. Thank you for having me as well. I'm happy to be sharing with you some tricks and things that I know from contributing to Rails in the last probably 10 years. I don't mm -hmm. even remember the dates anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah. Awesome. OK, so I think that, yeah, the Rails policeman, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that that's a funny story. I got that comment from some contributor from Rails after I made a decision that the person did not like much, and the person told me that who I was, like who who was me to make that decision, like a, <laughs> a self-appointed Rails policeman. So <laughs> I, I I like the titles, and that's why I kept. Is is the person still in the? project i i actually don't remember i remember i think that like i i could turn around that comment and actually welcome the person mm. to contribute later <laughs> probably the person is still contributing yeah mm. awesome okay so i guess we are going to get it started and maybe we can get started even with alessandro's question like how does one get started with contributing to rails and yeah, Rafael, the stage is yours. Okay, sounds good. So th there are many ways to contribute to Rails. And like the simplest way I would say is is probably be part of the community, uh, share your knowledge with other people. But in terms of writing code in the Rails repository, uh, you have a few avenues. Like one of them is to Look for open issues and try to fix those issues. Uh, can you share my screen, please? Yeah. So if you go to the Rails repository, you're going to see that we have almost five, five or 400 issues. And some of the issues have tags saying which kind of issues they are. And one thing that I, I like to tell people to use is Either this label, the good f first issue, I don't think mm -hmm. there are many here, but those are usually problems that the Rails got to identify it as like either a simple solution or like easy to navigate. So those are issues that people can open and try to contribute. The other one that I prefer to work on are the issues that they have the label with reproduction steps. Mm. Right now we don't have any. Actually, <laughs> it's because it's trying to use both ah. labels. Yes, okay. we have a few. And what those issues have in common is that either the, someone wrote a de de detailed way to reproduce the issue, or they provide a repository that you can run the tests and mm. see the results. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me increase my font. Yes. So like this repository. So 
For me, those are the easiest way to start because you can see the results of like, okay, what is the, this person reporting about? And you can try your code and see the results and be able to to put a debugger mm. in, in the Rails code base itself and try to see why uh, why the issue is happening. There mm -hmm. is another kind of reproduction steps that is probably this one. We have those reproduction scripts that are very small scripts mm -hmm. that execute Rails code. In this case, is executing the active record framework test suite, mm -hmm. defining some tables here, uh, defining the models as well, mm -hmm. and then trying to execute a, a simple test. That, that, that's actually pretty cool because that helped us mm -hmm. in the past, right? So it's a pretty easy way to run a whole application in just one file and you can just reproduce the error and then you can, like you said, put the debugger and see what's going on. Yes. Mm -hmm. So th those are the, the ways that I think are easy to people to start. The way that I prefer, and actually that's how I started, is fixing bugs mm -hmm. that I found myself, right? Like bugs that yeah. are happening in my application so I know how to reproduce, and I'm interested in fixing it. It's not because I fix it to other person. I fix it because it's my bug, and I, I need that to be fixed. Otherwise, I cannot work in my application. And that's one of the examples I have today. Like, I have a, a issue that is today on the mash, or main branch of Rails. is a bug, and mm -hmm. needs to be fixed, but it's not even open in the repository. I don't think nobody, like people knows about this bug yet. Actually, one person knows because I spoke with the author of the change. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yes, I, I can post in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, awesome. Can you, uh, actually, I don't, I'm not on YouTube, so can you please post that, Tiago? Yeah. Or... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now. Yeah, it's actually good that you added the first good issues because that's the first time that I saw open issues with that label. And that makes me ask you like a question because that's the main reason why we, it's harder to contribute to Rails because there aren't many good first issues. And how often do you see these issues there? Like how often are they created? So I, I think one of the problems with the good f uh, first issues is that they sometimes don't even say 10 minutes is open, right? Like if mm -hmm. someone see it, they fix. So it's really hard to for pe people in the real score to actually understand what are issues that are easy to, pop, to people to fix. Like it, it's not an easy classification, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. we think it's easy and then like ourselves spend days trying to fix the issue by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the other aspect is that Rails is a big project and there are a bunch of contributors that watch this repository. So mm -hmm. like sometimes people that are not part of the Rails team at all respond to issues in, in less than 10 minutes, mm -hmm. already open a, a pull request fixing it. And that's why I think it's hard to, to also create those, those labels because mm -hmm. like we don't even have time to read the issue and we already <laughs> have a pull request. They're so effective. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I remember when I started contributing to Rails, like, GitHub was way different. We had none of those features, right? Like, today I can watch a repository, mm -hmm. even that I, I don't have commit access. But before, I was not able to do that. So when I was starting to contribute to Rails, I was pre uh, refreshing this page every few minutes <laughs> to see if a new issue was open. So I opened the issue and tried to fix Mm. So that was how I started to work with Rails. But today you can get email in your inbox. You, yeah. you can watch and say, okay, I want to receive a notification and you get notifications as soon as someone open an issue. Do you think it's also a good idea, idea for people to try to reproduce an open issue? Maybe. Yes. Mm. So like a lot of issues don't have this label, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we don't know is like, uh, we can get those. Like, we don't even know if those things that are here are really issue or not. Mm. 
So mm. we need people to help you actually reproduce, right? So maybe this one has a reproduction step. Mm. Yeah. Mm. This one does not have a reproduction step. So someone needs to read this issue, understand if it's an issue or not, and comment for us, saying like, oh, I tried this in the Rails 6 one and it's working for me. Oh no, like it's true that Rails 6.0 has this bug. So letting the the contributors of the repository know mm. if the issue is really valid or not is also something that people can contribute. So Mike has a really good question. He wants to contribute to the documentation. And what's the best way to get started? I think it depends on the contribution. Like, it's hard, if, for example, to create a new section in, in the guides because, like, we need a very well, like, we have a very strict, uh, what's the name of the thing? We have a few strict rules, a guide is mm -hmm. yes, on how we want the Rails guide to be presented. Like, we, we like some tones in the voice. We we like it to not be extensive, like talk about every single feature of the framework, mm. but, but be clear, right? So if the contribution is about new section is harder, I think it's better to go to the Rails forum. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, now I try to remember the, the path for the forum. Yeah. Uh, Search ah, Google. This yes, this one. <laughs> Cool. It's better to go to the, to the Rails forum and mm -hmm. start the discussion there. We have a category only for the Rails core. Oh, nice. So you can create a new topic here and explain what you want to do uh, in the guides if it's a new section. If it's not a new section, what you want is actually fix an issue in the documentation. Today is like any regular change. You go to the file. And I can even show in my screen, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I here have the VS Code open. You can go to the guides folder. Mm -hmm. In the guides folder, you have all the sources. Let me increase. Mm -hmm. So you have the release notes of every single one. But let's say you want to change a guide about a active job. So you go there, you edit it, what you want to edit. I don't know, maybe the output of the generator changed. It's now created three files. So you go there and she, you say, okay, he created a new file here. There's uh, even an extra space on line 55. People could fix that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is. No, Easy no, it, issue. <laughs> no, that's correct, I think. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's two spaces. No, the, the 55? 55. Yeah, the, oh, those two? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's also correct because oh, okay, it's okay. inside the test. Oh, that, that makes sense. Sorry. But <laughs> let's say jobs started to have concerns, and now you have a, a concern for, like, it's been created, right? So not say that we are going to do this in Rails, but mm -hmm. supposedly you could do this, right? Ch uh, change the guides in the source itself. Yeah. You then create a branch and push to your fork, you open a pull request in Rails. Awesome. Okay, so I have a question. Yes. How do I choose where to start a discussion for um for example what Mike wants to do, I think it suggests some documentation uh, changes I feature. He, I think he wants to have a way to re regenerate locally or something. I remember yeah. that, but, yeah, but, something like that. Yeah, but my question is, when do I know which one, for which type is best to start a discussion on Rails forum then, rather than creating an issue on GitHub? Like, is that a recommendation for that? Yeah, so issues are like we try to reserve issues only for uh, bugs in the framework. Mm -hmm. But if it's like a, a discussion about the new feature, it's better to go to the Rails forum. Okay, got it. Oh, lost sound. Oh, you did? 
Really? Mm. Oh, no. It's okay here. <laughs> oh, but it was, was it us or? Oh. Let's keep going. So yeah. maybe let's. Uh, okay. I can hear. Okay. So thanks. maybe. Do, do you have an issue to work on, Rafael? Yes, I have. Okay. So, okay, uh, let, let's start with that. So, uh, like I was saying, sometimes I identify issues that are happening in the repository that, like, nobody else identify yet. And one of the reasons why I identify those issues is that I, I read every single commit in the repository. And... DHH was making a change to active storage, the JavaScript setup of active storage to be like already using new standards for JavaScript, like DS 2017, and also allowing Rails to be better used with like UMD packages and without having to to bundle all the files together. That's mm -hmm. one change that we plan to introduce on Rails 7 that David is working. So while he was working on that, he made a change on this file, the mm -hmm. Active Storage Engine, telling that now Active Storage and a new file called Active Storage ESM needs to be precompiled mm -hmm. by sprockets. That's everything is fine if you have a new application, but like if you have a Zish application, like our case at Shopify, we don't want those two files because we are not planning to use. And compiling two new files means that our application is spend a few minutes more or actually seconds more compiling those files that we are not going to use. So mm -hmm. what I'm going to do today is actually remove this because there is no way for us to opt in Mm. Uh, actually, to opt out in this behavior. So, like, if I upgrade Shopify to this version, I'm going to be compiling those two files. And I want a way to to allow new applications to uh, have those two files, but allow existing applications to not have those two files. So, not, to not be a requirement, just an optional thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. so it, it should be a default, but not. Uh, the default for new applications. So the way I usually work in Rails is that I know where I'm going to make the change. And in this case, I'm going to make the change the active storage. So I'm going to open the active storage engine. And I'm going to remove the file. Mm -hmm. Actually, not the file, the lines. So I can just go here and remove it. But if I do, if I just remove, I'm going to to break the behavior that David wants. So I, I cannot just remove. I need to find a replacement. And now the replacement I'm going to use is called this proxy manifest. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put the line back just people can see what I'm doing. But if you go to a file called uh, manifest, I think, Yes, manifest. Every single new applications that is generated uses rockets. You have a file inside config, uh, config, app assets config, mm -hmm. called manifest.js. And this, has, this file is equivalent to this precompile option in the assets uh, configuration. And what, what I can, and one of the advantages of this, this file is that it's very easy to opt in, opt out to, to like assets that you want to compile and not. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if you don't want to compile images, you just remove this file or mm -hmm. this line. If you want to compile, I don't know, all the JavaScript using sprockets, you can also do exactly what GitHub compiler is telling me <laughs> that you can add that line. <laughs> Copilot is <laughs> yeah doing the fix for you. So it, that's it. So that's interesting. So that file gets generated when you create a new Rails app, right? Yes. Oh, cool. So instead of having that on the source code, you just put it on a generator to use that new 
file format. Exactly. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change that line to use to use the link directive on its pockets. So I add the two lines here. Oh, I forgot the GS. Okay, I add the two lines and then I can remove this. Mm. So I right now I can test if this is going to work or not. So th there are many ways to do this. One of the ways is install the Rails version that you have here doing Rake build. So it's going to build a J. Actually, I forgot the bundle a sec. It's going to build a J so I can install the version. But I think that's too slow. I don't want to do that. <laughs> what I can also do is run the generator inside the Rails itself. Mm -hmm. So I have the folder rail tie. Uh, okay. I have the folder rail tie. Inside the rail tie, I have the executable for rails, right? It's the same one that when you start rails, you get. So if mm -hmm. I do help, you're going to. Uh, yeah, it's not working. Bundle is like. <laughs> yeah, I, I, maybe I need the bundle is like, but I, I should not. Let me see. <laughs> See, people, this is how the profession. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't need it. But it's like, yeah. so it's the same thing, right? I can generate a new application. So what I do sometimes to test is I like mm. generate application in the team P folder, mm. and I inspect the result of that application. Oh, that's cool. So I generate it. So now I can open a new VS Code Windows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then I have a Rails application. So now I can check if the file I told mm -hmm. to be generated was generated correctly. Oh, that's mm -hmm. pretty cool. And I can see here, yeah, it's true. I, I have those two lines that uh, I added. Instant feedback. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Yes. So in theory, that's fixed. Like, But David also did in another framework. He did in action tests. So let me see. Same thing. I I know the line already, but you you could, for example, search for it, right? Like you could search for config dot assets dot precompile mm -hmm. to see how many precompiles we have. So we have some MD files, actually. Yeah, let, let me hide this. I don't want this. So we have some MD files that I don't care about. And I don't have anything else. Oh, that's strange. Oh, yes, I only search in the guides. OK, <laughs> so now I search everywhere. Yeah, that's fine. I have uh, a demo application with these precompiles, but this is just a comment, so I don't care about that. Mm -hmm. I have the actual te action test precompile list also here. And now it is doing three lines, right? So I can do the same thing. I can just copy and paste this to be quick and add all the lines I want. Mm. Okay, that's also works. We can try. And be sure, like I can generate the application again. The only thing is that it's going to ask me to that the file changes, so I need to like overwrite all the files. It did mm -hmm. generate yeah. the app. I can open again. And yeah, now the three lines are here. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Let me ask you a quick question. So you're adding more stuff to the manifest. And I guess when you create, when you release that version of the code or the Rails version, do you have to also update the docs or have to do, put something on the change log for people to know that they're supposed to, to add those lines? 
Yes, that's a good way to think about this because I forgot to upgrade the docs. <laughs> so I, I can go and upgrade the docs if I want. Like, w it's a little bit hard because we would have to search for other lines that does this because mm -hmm. I don't know exactly where yeah. this is, at, is in the docs, right? So maybe we don't have anything. Yeah, I don't think we have anything to talk about this in the docs. Mm. The only thing that mm. we had to update is that not, like we are providing these those new files for a reason. And the reason for that is that when you have a Rails application, let me open the Rails application again. When you have a Rails application and you have your views, so like you have the application HTML layout, mm -hmm. you always do a style sheet yeah. application, right? Mm -hmm. So what the file is doing is allowing you to also do uh, also do JavaScript include tag. Oh. Oh, I always, OK. You can do this now. Oh, interesting. Before you could not do that. Mm -hmm. Before the active storage JavaScript would be bundled inside the application on JavaScript. Now, mm -hmm. the JavaScript can be like it's its own file, so you can include here. And why you would want to do that? So the reason why we are making this change is that browsers are getting more mature. And like we have HTTP2 as well to be able to do more requests in not only in parallel, but he uses the same connection. Mm -hmm. So there is no reason for us to be bundling out the JavaScript anymore if you are using modern browsers and if you are using HTTP2. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. So continue. Like I had mm -hmm. those five, five lines here. I, I could just like call this a day and my fix mm -hmm. is done. Uh, actually, let me see if I remove the the line incidentation. Yeah, I did. But what's the problem? The problem is like sometimes people generate applications without action text, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if they do create application, say, escape action text, what's going to happen? Uh, so I know already the result, but <laughs> Like what's going to happen is that the configuration is going to be the same, even though I don't have action tasks. Mm. Mm, so I should see. not have this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, someone is saying that there is an action line or a space. Oh. Good eyes. <laughs> line seven. Oh no, that space is correct. Yeah, so oh. yeah, it's a little bit confusing, I agree. So the difference is that link di directory takes two arguments. The first one is the directory itself. The second one is like which kind of files do you want inside mm -hmm. that directory? Mm -hmm. So if you want both JavaScript and CSS, you could have this. Mm. This is kind of like a filter. Yes, it's a filter for what you want here. Like if your style sheets folder have for any reason, you have like SVG files, you don't want mm. to precompile that. You only yeah. want to precompile the, the CSS. Yeah, that makes sense. That's interesting. All right. So, but, but that was a good point. So, uh, so I, I made the changes. Now I need to fix a problem. Like, I need to make sure that escape mm -hmm. action text is mm -hmm. not generating the files. Yeah. So, how I do that? So, let me actually make this bigger okay so rails like the regenerator has the option already and those options are defined inside a file in real time that define the generator i think the file is called mm -hmm. app base i know those files but it's actually better to search right so like people can have a feeling of someone that don't know the code base. So I could search for escape, action, text, 
and see what is defined. I see it's here in this file, the app base. And I can also see that there is a method defined called skip the action text with question mark. So I now can assume that maybe this method is what telling me that I can like ask Rails if I should generate actual text or not. So I don't have any usage of this method. What is strange? Actually, I have, but not directly. So I could, for example, see all the similar methods, like uh, what's the other method that I know? Skip active record, maybe it's prockets, right? Mm -hmm. I know this also exists. So I see a lot of places that does this, right? If the option is keep sprockets, remove this file. Nice. So I see I can do the same with actual text. So let me ask you a quick question. So you ge the generator will generate that file and then this other file will remove the file that is yes. created? Oh. Yes. But so I can use this method now in my template. So again, this is a template. It's not the right file, right? It's mm -hmm. going to be used to generate. So it's a set Ruby codes. So oh. I, I can show I can show all the templates that we know we are more used with. For example, a template that we are used with is the model generator, right? So what is the model generator? I don't know, but we can find the fix the side active record and lib rails generators active record this is here in the model templates and here I have more templates. So this is, is a template that generates the active record model that you see in applications. Mm -hmm. And as you can see is a ERB file that we embed some methods. For example, we have this method here to say, is the attribute a rich text? If it is, I can have a, a association with has rich text in mm -hmm. that attribute. Mm -hmm. So I can use the ERB on the file. And what I can do here is add a tag for skip actual text. Oh, I right? mm -hmm. But of course, I need some conditional. So unless it's skip actual text, and now mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you a trick about the ERB that I don't know if people know. But when you do an ERB like this, uh, I'm going to pose the tag to be fast. When you do an ERB like this, and you generate the file, EIB is going to, instead of the conditional, print an empty line. Oh. So we can check that, the result of the application. See, I have two empty lines, and I don't want those empty lines. Mm -hmm. So what I can mm -hmm. do is use this directive on ERB that's telling ERB to remove the empty line. Oh, so mm -hmm. the, the dash? Cool. Yeah. So if I generate the, the app again, I can see that the empty line is not there anymore. Mm -hmm. Neither is mm -hmm. the action text JavaScript. The dash tree. <laughs> <laughs> so Leonardo already knew it. Yeah, and I, now I need to do the same with active storage. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I have the same method, right? So I need to search. Skip active storage it's cool because it can even use on your own applications right the trick that you talked yes. about I, I, a little bit uh i try to control what my erb generates so i i remember that when i was programming in, in big rails applications as a consultant i always went to erb files to add this dash everywhere mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So C D. Yes. <laughs> no no empty lines. Oh I don't know if we have active storage skip active storage. So that's Oh, strange. I think you have an extra R. Oh yeah, that's true. It's true. Yeah. Good eyes. <laughs> yeah, I have the same method. So I can use in the same way. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
active. So I add the dash now. Mm -hmm. And then I, and copile it also on the suit on the suit that I want the dash now. So mm -hmm. I'm going to test actually I, the text is wrong because I need to pass a new option. The escape action active storage. And now my file mm -hmm. is empty if I don't have any of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's actually a cool trick to regenerate the, the app and see if, if mm -hmm. you have what you wanted. Yes, but that's now how I work on this. And now I'm going to show <laughs> how I work. Okay. So <laughs> tell us the real the real story. <laughs> so I, I don't often do TTD, but to fix bugs, I always do TTD because I actually know what the behavior I want already. So I write the, the test first and then I fix the bug. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the same with the reproduction script, right? Like I have the reproduction script already so I can use it to execute the code that they put by bugs where I need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now I need to write a test for this. I did not run any tests inside Rails, and that's going to be my first test. The first thing I do is like I go to the part of the framework I going I change right now, yeah. and you can see that I changed the Rail ties mm -hmm. framework right to add to edit the template. So I go to the Rail ties folder. Inside the Rail tie, I can run bundle exec rake text. Test and it's going to run all the tests. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But real time is the biggest part of, of Rails, and now mm -hmm. I have something broken. Oh, yeah, I need to install Yarn. Not install. So, let me. And I, I need to it. run. Because <laughs> it's something that happens a lot to people. Like sometimes you just want to run a test and then, but you have to do Yarn build. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, we need to improve that. That's, <laughs> that could be a good contribution if anyone wants to try to remove. Yes. They need to me to run yarn mm. before running the test. So now I can run the test, and now I got another error. Oh. Mm. Bundler? Why is it taking that? No, it's the same thing. It's yarn mm -hmm. is failing. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Blade. What is blade? Uh, Blades is the framework we use to run Yarn. Ah, okay. okay. But why is failing? I have no idea. I love that reality. <laughs> That's reality video. check. What I can do is like something li little bit nasty, because I I can shoot right now in in the live stream, right? So I I going to just check out the files I don't want to to. <laughs> To bring this one, I'm going to add all those files and generate a patch. Mm. Uh, let me see if hit patch. Actually, oh, I generate the patch. I don't remember anymore. I think it's git diff. Git diff. Okay. Yes, I, I think I can generate a patch with this. Mm. And I'm going to apply uh, another machine I have here. Hmm. I, I use uh, different. Uh, my developing environment is in the cloud, so I have different machines that I can use. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that this machine can run the test. So, let's Someone, see. so Ryan is asking which Rails version are you using? I'm right now I'm working in the main branch and that's Rail 7 0. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's failing it as well. Mm. Uh, just me double check if that's the right version. Yeah, it is. I'm going to change the Ruby. Now it should work. Mm -hmm. 
Well, not if the gene does not is not stalled. Yeah, it did work. Nice. So okay, this machine can work. So let's apply our patch. So I going to do a git apply. I think am maybe and then get the patch I just generated. Hmm. Let me open a new file, save it. Uh, I have the fire here. Cool. Uh, okay, I can remove the patch and now we can move on. Actually, I for I forgot to save some things, so <laughs> let me close all the files. So remove the lines here. Oh, it's not this one. It's this one. Remove this this line. That's one of the lines I don't want. Mm -hmm. And this line that I also don't want. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have the same patch as I had before. I can run all the tests if I want, mm -hmm. but what I want really to run is the test for the generators. So I can try to find the test for it. So how I do, how I do that, I usually search for the thing I want to test, right? So I want to test mm -hmm. skip action, Mm. Text. And I can see here, I have a, I have a, a app generator text file. Nice. With doing the exactly thing I want it to be doing, that generates the app. So now I just need to assert it some way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I also have one for escape active storage here. Mm -hmm. So I can do exactly the same thing. Maybe modify the, the test um, I have to assert if the thing I want to be done is being done correctly. Yeah. But in this case, I'm going to create a new test. I'm going to just copy the test I have right here for action text. I'm going to add here and say, I want that app generator does not generate the active storage contents when this option is given. Mm. So I run the generator. I'm going to delete this part because I don't want. And I'm going to assert this, right? Like those, oops. Those file, oh, what I trying to do? <laughs> I try to <laughs> unindent this. <laughs> I don't know how to. Shift, Shift tab. tab, yes. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to run this test just to make sure it's running without modifying anything. So I can use a, a test file that's inside the bin and pass mm -hmm. the path of this file. Oh, so that's how you do it. That's much better. <laughs> much easier. Yeah. Uh, okay, now we, are, we have an issue. Let me see what it is. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm already inside the folder, so yeah, yeah. I don't need the folder. So you run all the tests just to make sure everything is passing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So someone, uh, Jonathan asked an interesting question about having a developer environment in the cloud. Is that because if you have something not working on your local so why, why do you have that uh so the reason why i have that i, I actually have this setup also working locally but it's because in shopify our developing environment is on the cloud for any project oh, okay. and we have some machines already there that we can create on demand or destroy on demand that already give me a, a environment set up in the way i want 
Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's just a way to be quick. Mm-hmm. And I can, for example, I can, if people want to do that, I can start a new setup from scratch and show people how I set up my environment. Like that could be a different life if you want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's actually pretty interesting because it makes your life much easier, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, some people use the Docker containers to do that. Like even in the Rails project, we have the a Vagrant setup for this as well. Like you can use a Vagrant machine for working in the Rails repository. But at Shopify, we are using a similar thing as a Docker container, but the container is running in the cloud, and not in mm-hmm. our machines. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. It looks like the test passed. Yes, the test passed. So I, I can use a, a TDD approach, right? I can, for example, tell I only want to run this test. So it's the line 399. Mm-hmm. It's good to start to run this test. OK, it's running. I can now uh, open the file I want. It actually start to actually going to remove everything that I added just to make sure that the test I'm writing is going to fail if mm-hmm. I don't have the code. Yeah. So now I, I can, for example, say I want to assess the, the file called Actually, how is this test passing? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it, it, it should be passing. It's just that we don't need this app. Okay. But mm-hmm. Could we move? We are in the right place already. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I add this part, right? Yes. That's mm-hmm. is the part I added. So I want to check if the config, actually not config, is app assets config uh, manifest.js file. Does not have in the contact. Uh, I think we need to change this. We does not have in the context like a mm-hmm. link to active storage, mm-hmm. right? We don't have, we don't want that. Yeah. And also, we don't want to have the active storage ESM there. Mm-hmm. So this test is good. Uh, what failed? Oh yeah, I removed the happy hood so. Mm. Now it's it's confusing, so I can add it back. So the test is passing because I did no changes, but let's say I add the thing I wanted back, but I remove the mm-hmm. skip active storage. Mm-hmm. Now my test is failing because I have those lines there. Yeah. Which you don't want. Yeah, I don't want that. Mm-hmm. I can also make the test more explicit because I want to check if this is on in the beginning of the line. So mm-hmm. I can, for example, use the the anchor of the beginning of the line, make sure that mm-hmm. the line is not there. So let me add back the active storage. Okay, test is passing as well. I can check mm-hmm. if all the tests are passing. But I'm going now to write the one for active storage. Oh, act, active action text. Mm-hmm. So let me copy this one. Okay, so I have a, a question. Don't know if this is a good time. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I shall worry. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna call you I Ash. <laughs> uh, thanks for the question. That's a good question. I think that, for example, for this issue, you already know that's going to be accepted, <laughs> uh, and you already have lots of context with it. But in the case that, for example, it I don't have lots of context and not lots of context, but I didn't talk to someone and I made a PR and then 
it might take you know a few, a few weeks and so the question is how can we proactively and effectively ask for feedback on the prs that we get um, so have any suggestions yes so i i think asking in the in the PR or the issue is a good way, especially in PRs. Like in issues, it's, it's harder because, like, mm. as any open source, actually, as the most of open source projects raised is run by volunteers, it's not mm -hmm. like some people are paid to work there. Like, for example, I am, like, I can work full time on this, and Shopify pay, pays me for that, but not everyone does that. So, like, mm -hmm. it's hard to tell people that they, should be take care of every single issue, every single pull request, even the ones that don't affect them, because they do this in their free time sometimes. And mm -hmm. they have family, they have life that they need to, to take care. Another way is to post, if it is a PR, to, to post in the discuss forum as well, mm. like asking for feedback there. Sometimes that works, sometimes people pay attention to it and actually like get reminded that there is a pull request that needs to be reviewed. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of things that people sometimes don't do before asking this. For example, like, did you make sure that the tests are passing? Did you make sure that like the documentation is is updated? If mm -hmm. it is an issue, like, can you try to fix? Like, mm -hmm. maybe you don't know how to write the code, but maybe you know how to reproduce the issue mm. right so like you can write a reproduction script or you can uh, comment how people can reproduce so those things usually uh, makes the pull request or if the issue should get more attention because like if it, if the pull request is as easy as like I'm open the pull request and like review it to say, okay, it looks good in merge. Like it's way faster to get feedback data pull request that like, I don't know, 100 lines that mm -hmm. like the tests are not passing, mm -hmm. that we don't know if the concept is good or not. Mm -hmm. And also if you explain the problem well, right? I guess it helps you. It helps the person that is reviewing the, the PR to make mm -hmm. it very explicit. So this is a problem. This is how it works. Maybe you don't know how to reproduce, but at least explain it well. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so sometimes people just like, there are some PRs that are easy to reply because they are fixing small issues or they are very actionable, right? Like they have a test, regression text, text there already. They have the... They fix it, they explain what's the impact of the issue. Like, is that issue impact every single Rails application? Is that issue impact just a few Rails applications? Mm -hmm. Like, of course, you cannot know that. But for example, if the issue is in the way that Active Record generates a SQL query every time you call the count method, and it's always wrong, we are going mm -hmm. to take care of that quickly. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Okay. I think that there's just one more because it's related to that one. Mm -hmm. um, so the the the, the bashings, uh, I think he also asked a good question because I think it's related to that. Uh, if I'm a completely beginner, and for example, yeah, I I, I wouldn't start with Active Records, <laughs> but do you think uh, there is a a model that is easier to get started, and you know it's like you said, it's not urgent, so you, you won't, and you won't break things. Um, so, do you re which one, which module do you recommend to get started? I think it depends on the, what the person likes. Like you said, you would not start with Active Record, <laughs> but there are people that actually start with Active Record, even mm -hmm. being the biggest framework inside the Rails, and it's the one with most bugs. Like we also tags uh, issues per framework and if you look for active record, most of the issues are on that framework. Mm -hmm. I started with action view specifically on how generates inputs, fields and HTML tags inside the IB files. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> the reason for that is like I was more used to this part of the code. I was more used to why write Rails applications, uh, caring a little bit more about front end, a little bit more about the views that are being generated. So I knew the things that work well and did not work well. So to me, it's more like is it depends what what the person is more uh, used with. Mm -hmm. If if the person is more used with active records, like mm -hmm. if they care about getting the best query being generated by the framework, so that maybe be the best way for them to start. Like we have mm -hmm. a huge contributor, uh, Ryuta Kamipo at GitHub. He does a lot of contributions and he mostly focuses on active records. That's where he started. And his main focus is still on that framework. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's like, awesome. It's yeah. a good advice. Thanks. Good advice. <laughs> so yeah, let's continue. Uh, actually, we we are past the hour, so maybe we should open for questions. Yeah, yeah. I was going yeah. to ask you how. Like, mm. I, I could continue here, and what I was planning to do is to implement the actual text. Mm -hmm. Text is the same thing, but mm -hmm. we don't need to do now. I can do it later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's I see just... if people have more questions. Mm -hmm. Just one question that I have. So you probably would commit everything and create a PR for those changes. And you mentioned there was no issue, right, for that bug. Yes. So do you have to create the issue as well? No, like what I, what I, not I just I, but usually what contributor does with with these situations, like they explain the issue in the board of the PR. Oh, I see. So they explain in which problem is being solved here. So you could, like in my case, I will explain, for example, that after that change that David did, those assets are always pre-compiled, even applications that don't need it. So I implement an easy way to opt out to that behavior. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I think... We, we still have a few questions that that was great. It was actually great to see you getting all the errors and yeah. <laughs> moving so around. TDD. Yeah, <laughs> TDD. Um, so let's put the, the slides probably. So I have a few questions already and we are now going to the Q&A time. So drop your questions now, but I will review some that were already asked. So we have here Todd. Todd is asking if some of the non-security fixes are backported, backported, and if that could help reproduce the bug, bugs on an earlier version. Yes, I think that's a, a good way to, to to contribute. Like usually, backports are automatic because, like, mm. actually not automatic, but if the backport is from a fix of an existing issue, we usually check the version that the person reported in backport. Unless, of course, it's an old version like Rails 5.2 or even 6.0 to those days. But a good way to contribute is also make sure that like we are not forgetting to fix the issues in the versions that are supported. So right now it's 6.1. It's the only version supported for bug fixes. So mm -hmm. checking that every single fix is also that's relevant on Rails 6.1 is also backported is a way to contribute. Awesome. Awesome. Great question, Todd. Uh, all right, so I have another one from Alessandro. Alessandro asks, let's say that he chooses one issue to fix. How does he know that no one else? Well, yeah, how, how do you handle that? Not knowing if someone else is also fixing it or if mm -hmm. someone, yeah, like, how do you approach work, that yeah. at the same time? <laughs> so if it's an open issue, you can comment in the issue saying, oh, I work on this. And mm -hmm. usually what that does is like sometimes people will still work in open API, but the, the maintenance of the repository always pay attention that like who opened the API first. Mm -hmm. And we accept only the PRs for the, the people that 
he then said, I'm going to work on this. And we know the person already volunteers. So if another mm -hmm. person opens the PR, we say, let's wait the other person. Or maybe we, sometimes we even do, and even work with both people to make them work together. Like, mm, that's great. Maybe one write the test, the other one write the implementation. Or maybe mm -hmm. the test that the, the other person wrote is better than the, or the other one. So we, we merge mm -hmm. both chains together. Uh, that's actually pretty cool. So people can kind of collaborate on an issue together. Is there, is there something like a timeline? Or I guess it maybe it depends on the severity of the bug. But let's say there's an open issue and someone says, hey, I'm fixing this. But then person takes a while to fix it and is an important uh, bug uh, what happens in that case sorry can you repeat the question so um, wh what I'm asking is if let's say it's a bug that is a severe Great bug mm -hmm. and then someone goes there and say hey I'm gonna I'm gonna fix this bug I'm gonna work on this issue but then it takes a while for the person to finish oh. So what like, happens in that case? <laughs> like, if it's a severe bug, we usually don't even like let the the person volunteer. Like, if mm -hmm. it's really severe, that needs to be released in the next two days. We we prefer to fix ourselves. Like, mm -hmm. that usually happens a lot with security issues. Like, sometimes mm -hmm. we fix a bug and then we introduce another one. That one needs to be fixed in the same day. So we don't even allow the like anyone to fix. A good example of that was the mine magic issue that happened a few months ago mm -hmm. like the community could have fixed it but like we prefer to fix ourselves because we knew that we needed to do a bunch of releases different chains that like we had to coordinate that work between ourselves the mm. allowing the community to do it oh i see yeah that makes sense so we have another interesting question from paulo how do I know when I need to run all the rails or just a part of it, like the bundle way of running just a piece of the code? Yeah, I guess he wants to know if he needs to run all the uh, tests or just a couple of them. I think that's, it becomes a feeling in the beginning. Oh, after a while, but like in the beginning, I, I use the same framework that I'm changing and only run that one, right? And after I do the, I open the PR, the CI is going to tell me that I broke all the things. So when I was starting, what I did was like, I was working action view and I only run the action view text, test. And if I was working active record, I only run the active record test. And after I open the PR, we have the, they say I broke it for some other reason, another framework, I would just fix after that. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. All right. So we're trying not to miss all the questions, everyone. Um, I think we have a few more minutes. So let's see. Yeah, maybe we can go from who asked first. I already reviewed all of them, so you mm -hmm. can go to the bottom. So I think you, Julian is. Mm. Uh -huh. So Julian, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, is there a plan to update the buggy modules in Rails? I'm not very familiar with the subject since it has been some time since I use Rails. Uh, I actually want to know exactly what those debugging modules are. Mm -hmm. Like, is it the debugging feature in Ruby? Because if it is, mm. that's more like a Ruby problem than uh, a Rails problem. Mm -hmm. But I know that in one of the plans from Ruby 3.1 is to improve the debugger. And Koichi is working on that already. Even introducing not only a different debugger, but also I in integrated debugger with different uh, code editors. Like I can debug on, on VS Code. VS Code, for example, using this new debugger that Koichi is building. Hmm. Oh, that's, okay. that's amazing. It's going to help a lot. Yeah. I, I think my, not this machine, maybe, yeah, not this one. But I have a few machines that I could use to contribute to Rails that I have the buy bug 
already integrated on VS Code. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> so that's how you fix all the bugs so quickly. <laughs> you have all the tools. <laughs> to be fair, not a, a debugger person. I do a lot of puts in the code. I did not <laughs> need to do any, any here. But I usually, when I fix the bugs, I always spread a lot of puts inside the code and try to debug using that. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I think we all do that. And people think that, <laughs> oh, developers, they just know where the bug is. Yeah. You know, they just have a feeling, but that's not true. We have to debug <laughs> and put a bunch of comments. And yeah, that's the real life. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, Rafa, I actually forgot to ask you how much time do you have for the question? Because we still have a few questions. I think we have three questions. So, maybe. Yeah, I, I think I can stay uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Awesome. awesome. So, let's go. Charles has another question. So, so if I have a WooCommerce or WooCommerce or Magento or Shopify specific issues, is there something special I should do to tech? Uh, in Rails, we usually don't deal with any issues specific on Shopify, right? Right? Like mm -hmm. we are not fixing issues for Shopify, the application itself. We are fixing issues for framework, so we don't have anything to tag there. And mm -hmm. I don't even know if Rails, the Rails repository, is the right one to tag mm -hmm. to open the issue. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a that's a good question. That's good to know. Um, all right, and then Caroline asks, how do the maintainers of Rails plan the releases? Is it hard to summarize all the contributions on the change log? So they really, we don't plan releases. I mean, neither in terms of when we are going to release, neither in terms of what we are going to release. We go with the flow, I would say. And I, I mean, usually the person that releases, Mm -hmm. I, I think it's rare when other person releases. So my my <laughs> way of thinking about releases is that I try to release every month. Sometimes mm -hmm. I fail because I have other things to do, or sometimes I forget. But that's my goal: is releasing one version every month. When I say one version, it's like six zero one, six zero two, six zero three. About the Rails 7 or Rails 6.1 or Rails 6, like the big releases, we aim to release every year before RailsConf. Not every year that works. Like, for example, in 2020, we had problems because of COVID. So I could only release Rails 6.1 in December. So like it was more than six months of delay. Mm -hmm. This year, the same RailsConf, our red passed, I think, was in, in April or May, or oh, actually mm -hmm. on March. And we she did not release, but the reason for that is that we did not have time to work on the things we want to work on. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anyone saw this, but usually we do like two minor releases before going to the major release. So it should be mm -hmm. six zero, six one, and six two. But we are skipping the six two because we had the big plans. So those big plans would make a Rails 7. Mm. But we did not have time to work on those big, big plans yet. So <laughs> there is no way for us to release Rails 7. And I think there is a question about yeah. when Rails 7 is going to be released. I don't have an answer for that. I know that differently from the last few months, I see some activity in those big features. So the people that should be working there are working there. So maybe I would have a better answer in, in a few weeks or a few months, but right now I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. We have another question from Breno. Uh, there's a tag called needs feedback. What is it used for? Uh, so we have a few things in Rails. One of them is the triage team. It's like there are people that go to the issue tracker in the pull requests and review PRs or make sure that the, the issues are actually valid. And they use this tag to tell Rails core members or even others like Rails committers, people that actually can make decisions about the framework that they are waiting for someone 
to give feedback about the feature, if the feature mm. makes sense or not. Uh, sorry. Yeah. I have a question about that, just a curiosity. So you mentioned that you are working on projects for the next version of Rails. And who who works on that? So who decides, uh, let's say uh, it's it's a project that you proposed or someone else proposed. So how, how do you distribute the work? So Rails was always instructed. So what happens like I, for example, wants a feature. So I work on that feature and say, oh, I plan to do this. And I just tell the people, this is my plan. Sometimes people say, oh, yeah, let's wait and see what's going to happen. Sometimes they ask questions right away. When I see people, mm -hmm. the other members of the Rails team. So who work on those features are usually the person that's interested in implementing it, right? Mm -hmm. I, I can give a few examples, like the the PR that I'm fixing right now that David was opening is because David has a plan to introduce a different way to deal with assets in Rails, in Rails mm -hmm. 7. So he's working on that. I'm only reviewing his code. And another one making changes to the framework to allow this feature to happen. It's David that's working on that. I'm mm -hmm. working on a different feature that has nothing to do with that. Uh, and like we have people at Shopify, for example, working in features that we have interest on. We have people at GitHub working features that they have interest on. And the release, the plan for the release is, it happens like this. People say, I want to work on this. And we mm -hmm. get all those ideas together in a place and we don't even know what those ideas are. It's just like, we all know the title of the thing sometimes. <laughs> like, for example, for Rails 7, one of the things we know is about Turbo, but I did not look much in Turbo yet, so I don't know how Turbo is going to work. I know it's mm -hmm. going it's this, and people are working on it. And GitHub is working on... Next release was in the Mood database uh, schema. Yeah. Uh, changes, right? Ellen was working on that with Jean and the other Jean, the two Jean works on that. <laughs> but yeah, the two Jean's Ellen were working on the mood database change, mm -hmm. and I did not know what the plans they had to the feature. Like the plan was happening, like I was knowing about the plan while they were implementing. So the open PRs we discussed on top of it, but other than then the large vision, we don't have specifics. We don't discuss the, those specifics until the piazza is open, for example. Hmm. Oh, That's interesting, because I always had in mind that you guys had like a weekly <laughs> stand up or, or something. something. <laughs> so I think I worked with the Rail Scott team for four years without having had a meeting with them. Even, the dream. even seeing their face. Like mm -hmm. it was four years before I I could see people's face. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, especially now that everyone is going remote and uh, some people are struggling with that. Like that's a great example. It works well. I have I have even funny stories. Like Casper, I, I work with Casper T. Hansen, he's a race call member. And we worked together for one year. He was my student in the Ruby. Some or oh, actually it was the Google Sum of Code project, mm. and we went. We both went to Railscoff, <laughs> and we went to Railscoff. We were in a dinner together with all the Rails core members, and in the end of the dinner, I asked like, "Do anyone see Casper?" He said that he he was going to come to the dinner, but I did not see Casper. And Casper was right beside me, <laughs> but I did not know who Casper was. <laughs> didn't even know him. <laughs> yeah, That's great. He, he was my student to work with me for one year. You, you just knew his avatar. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No. Maybe people should go with a T-shirt with their avatar just to have their, or their name. Yeah. Name yeah. Tags. <laughs> name tags. Yeah. 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 The other one is Matthew. I think I I work with Matthew for two years without seeing his face, <laughs> even knowing what Matthew was. The first time I saw Matthew was when we were redoing the Rails website and we had to put some drawings of our, ourselves in the site. Mm -hmm. So we had to send a picture of ourselves so the, the artists could draw mm -hmm. our pictures. That was the first time I saw Matthew's face because he had to send a picture. 
<laughs> Man, well, that's a uh, that's a good contribution for Rails. Like, make people meet each other. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> meetups. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Rafael, I think we could ask the last question. Last question from Julian. I think it's Julian. Mm. Um, so, if you release every month, how much do you think about backwards compatibility? Uh, I always. So I actually there is another question there about the change log, mm. and oh, I, I use it, like I said I use the release right. So mm. when I release it, Rails I check Sorry. about, I check every single commits. Mm. I read every single commits every, almost every day. That's part of my job. So I always check for backwards compatibility. It's funny that you even see people sometimes measure PR. And then I can say like this is wrong, it's going to break because of X, and I reverse the PR. Mm -hmm. And today there are two ways I use for these ones. I read the code, so I I know. But the other one is like I use the Shopify test suite. The I don't even know the number of tests, but it's probably thirty thousand tests that we run in the main monolith. I run that to know if Rails is going to break to other users. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's like I know that a feature is broken even before releasing because it it broke the rails or the Shopify test suite. Mm. Oh, that's pretty interesting. So you have a larger uh, test code base that you just try things out. And uh, it's not only larger, but it's testing things that we don't test because mm -hmm. like who is writing that rail test suite is the same person that who is writing the code. Mm -hmm. But when we are using the Shopify test suite, we, like is is a bunch of people writing code without knowing the implementation. So mm -hmm. we find a bunch of edge, edge cases looking mm. or running the test suite or, uh, at Shopify. And when I say always, it's like it's really always like even on major versions of the framework, we always implement new features in a way that old applications still work with the new feature. Mm -hmm. And for example, the change I was making today was for that, right? Like, I don't want mm -hmm. old applications to have new files that could break. Mm -hmm. So I think about backwards compatibility here and allow new applications to have the feature, but old applications don't have it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's... Yeah. So you are the Rails policeman. <laughs> but... You really are. <laughs> Yeah. Keeping things working. Um, awesome. Yeah, I. So I don't see any more questions in the chat, but I, I really have. I have one, Rafael, because um, that's that's from the work that we have been doing, and it's something that I would like to know your opinion. Because, for example, I I don't have a lot in experience contributing to Rails, but I really want to to get it started because I want to make it more inclusive to everyone. But then, for example, because I don't know how to write the code in the best way, like I'm not an expert yet. Um, and sometimes I worry that I'm wasting people's time because like you said, uh, almost everyone is volunteer, right? And it's kind of hard to balance that. Like I want to contribute, but I also don't want to waste people's time. Like how do you have any advice for that? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that I give people a lot of feedback about is like the kind of contributions they want to do. Like there are many contributions that people can do that are, in my opinion, amazing. But sometimes it makes us lose focus in the things that is important, right? Like mm -hmm. sometimes people fix like typos in files. Mm -hmm. that are not like files that the user will see, like, for example, the test files of the framework. Sometimes people try to improve performance on methods that are not used a lot. Sometimes people try to refactoring code just to get better to understand the Rails code base. Mm -hmm. And those code inputs are good. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I started doing those. But depending on the amount of contributions you do in this mm -hmm. type, is distractors, right? Because I could be fixing a bug because I'm open a PR to fix a bug, but I'm reviewing a method that's being moved from a file to another one. Mm -hmm. So we 
recommend people to not open that. We sometimes even say that we don't accept cosmetic changes. That that's mm. what we are calling them. Yeah. I do accept them sometimes when I see it's a new contributor or someone that is not used to to do to the framework yet. Sometimes it's really way better and I see yeah this makes sense. But it's more like oh. It depends on who is reviewing it, right? Some mm -hmm. people could be more harsh and say, no, I don't want this, and close mm -hmm. the PR. So I think that any PR contribution that is to fix a bug is welcome. Mm -hmm. And this is never like losing anyone's time. You mm -hmm. should be pinging people to say, yeah, like this is your bug. You should like helping me to, to close. Mm -hmm. Of course, after a few months, if nobody replies, <laughs> it, it's probably because that bug is not important. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think like the best way to contribute to Rails is fixing bugs mm -hmm. and like make sure that you're not losing any much time. Yeah, yeah, it sounds good. I think that's a, a great way to to wrap up. And I also think it doesn't hurt to just try. Like, well, okay, uh, this is what I think. How I can help at the moment. And someone will say, yeah, OK, we can't actually accept this at the time, but at least try. You already have the no, so try it out. Uh, of course, just be respectful. And I think that's the, that's the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, we also are more lenient to, to help people that are starting to contribute. So mm -hmm. like, like I said, those contributions for new contribu contributors are fine. And I use them because mm -hmm. I know is a is a way to incentivize people to continue to contribute, mm -hmm. right? But then when I see them to start to do the same thing over and over again, I try to direct them to, to the right path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Maybe we can discuss that a little bit next time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we are wrapping up everyone because, you know, Rafael was already giving his time and all. You might be tired, but <laughs> just to wrap up, uh, thank you so much, everyone, this, for the support, for being here. Thank you, Rafael, for helping us today, answering the questions. I, I hope everyone learned a lot. Rafael is really a nice person, so if you meet him in one of the Ruby or Rails Conf, say hi. He's a nice person. You, you know his face now. Yeah, so. you already know his face, so that's solved. And we just would like to say thanks to Shopify again one more time. Gabi, Mercy, Samantha, Ivan, thanks for all the help and for all the support. And Shopify is becoming now a, a big company that people are looking up for the good practices. So it was the perfect choice for this project to happen. Mm -hmm. And what else? What am I missing? <laughs> yeah, so this is made for you. So, uh, oh, sorry, go on, Hafati. Want to say yeah. something? Uh, I just want to say that if people have more questions, like they can tweet to me. Mm -hmm. so my tweet is Rafael Franca all together, and I can reply asynchronously without any problem. I think there is one question that I did not answer that just someone just asked. It. So mm -hmm. if you have that question, just tweet to me, I can answer. Awesome. Yeah, yeah thanks great. for the availability. And by the way, uh, we're doing this for you. We want to help you learn. And we, we will have two more of these expert sessions with people from Shopify. So we're super excited about that. Uh, we, we're, so Rafael, I guess, not sure if Rafael will yeah, come back or we someone don't know, else. But but... Let us know who would you like to see here. Yeah. <laughs> Peer pressure. And yeah, what would you like to learn next? Let us know. Uh, and I think that the best way is to sign up for our newsletter in our website. This is the best way to keep everyone in the same page. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's it, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a Thank great you. day. Bye-bye. Bye. See ya.